What is up, everybody? Ed Gow Jr. from Dad Central. I'm joined by my man from Dad Central. Drew Solon. Director <laughs> you had to get you. Thanks, <laughs> you always surprising me. Yeah, hey, I got to keep you on your toes. Got to keep you going. How you doing, Drew? I'm doing well, Ed. I'm looking forward to another great conversation and getting some, I think, great insight um, from someone who's going to you know, share, I think, a lot. So I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I know. And we're really happy to get some of his positive, productive time. But before we go any further, let's just remind you that That Central Show is sponsored by Dove Men Plus Care. Dove Men Plus Care believes that care is the best of a man because when a man cares for themselves and others, there's positive impact. We have someone, you know what? This is going to be a really fun show today. Really good conversation. So we're going to get right in it. We're not going to do anything fluff. We're going to get right at it. We today have Vincenzo Guzzo, He's who's one of the stars of Dragon's Den on CBC television and also runs Cinema Guzzo. So we're going to bring him up right now. He's just coming back from vacation, so we didn't want to tax him. So I got a bit of a tan here. (laughs) So we are so happy to have you today. So welcome and thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Drew? Well, it's a great honor uh, to have you on the show. One of the things we were talking about before we came out was uh, your children. You've got five children, let alone, obviously, the the notoriety that you have for the work that you've done in your family business and having grown it. And, of course, now being on Dragon's Den and, you know, the amazing you know things that you're bringing to that show. But today we're talking fatherhood, which is probably a little lesser known. And so I'm really excited to be able to get a little insight into the family and into your role. But also I, it also seemed from our research your father has a significant role to play in this as well. So one of the things we love to talk about early on is to get an understanding of where per our guest has come from. So you're talking a little bit more about where you've grown, like what was life like for you growing up? And then if you want to talk a little bit about the relationship with your father, we think that's a great place to start. So, you know, a uh, known, a uh, very little known fact is I'm an only child, okay. uh, but not by choice. In other words, my parents had other children after me, but, my mom uh, uh, had four other children a term, but none of them survived uh, mm-hmm. past the pregnancy. One of them survived 30 days. And then uh, so I became a very important person to my mm-hmm. mom and to my dad. Um, so much so that, you know, the relationship with my father was uh, at, at, at some times was a little rocky because I was the only one. So there was no, oh, well. You know, he won't be what I aspired one of my kids to be, but I got another four to look up to, you know, or to try with, right? It was everything was put behind one pony, and that pony had to, you know, had to succeed, had to deliver, and so forth. The the thing that I remember the most, and still today, I mean, my dad's still alive, so I still have these conversations. The thing that I really, really, really adored as a child was being part of the discussions. Mm-hmm with my mom and my dad. So when they argued about money, when they argued about, you know, how the business should be run or anything, you know, what color should the, 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 you know, the house be painted or whatever. I was part of the conversation. Mm. Uh, And so in today's society, you know, you'd probably get a therapist tell, you know, you're not supposed to do that because, you know, you're making your child grow uh, quicker than he should. And he should, you know, he should be hanging around people his age or whatever. But it allowed me a certain level of maturity, which also then allowed me to realize that my closest friends are over 60, but I'm only 50, 53, Mm -hmm. right? So some of my closest friends are 65, 66. uh, And because I have that bond, that connection, on Dragon's Den, the person I bonded with the most uh, before Robert came on was Jim Tree Living. He's my father. Actually, he's, he's two, three years older than my father. Right. And I bonded with him. And because of the bond with him, it made me more tolerant or more um, a better son, I, I should say, with my dad, where, you know, at, at 50 years old, sometimes you, you, you know, so many things go on in your everyday life and, and your dad calls you up about something. And you say, look, honestly, I, you know, you don't want to say it, but in your mind, you're saying, I don't have time for this. Like, this is like, I get a secretary to do this, or I get one of my lawyers to take it. What do I have to take care of, right? Uh, but 
after Dragon's Den, after having done a few shows with Jim, I said, you know what? Why am I so tolerant with Jim? Why am I so accepting of, of Jim, you know? And, and why is it that I can't have the same patience with my father? Um, and so that got me to thinking when I was younger. And then I, then I remembered what one of my grandfathers used to always say. When you raise children, it's like you're raising pigs. They will never appreciate you as a parent. You will never be appreciated till they become a parent. And then they start going through the growing pains. And so today I can tell you I have a newfound respect uh, for my father, um, for the stuff he went through, uh, for my mother, for the things she went through, growing up with one child and so forth and so forth. And obviously that always brings me back to, you know, I, I say this to my children all the time. All I wanted for Christmas was a brother. Mm. All I wanted. I didn't want any gift. I wanted a brother. And I said, God never gave me one. So when I see my kids bickering amongst themselves, I go crazy. I said, Seriously, guys, this doesn't make sense. Like if I had a brother, I mean, him and I would be like, you know, like Batman and Robin. Like we'd be like, you know, <laughs> duo, the crazy guy. You know, the have a duo. Kid. That's right. And that's the kind of bond I found with Robert Hershevac that's, you know, now back on the show. And he's like my older brother. And he says, really? You're, you know, he likes to say, he likes to think he's younger than me, but he's older than me. <laughs> and you remind him that every time, don't you? I do. Well, you know what I tell him? I tell him, don't, don't make the mistake. Only because people ask me how old I am and I say I'm 63. And so people say, Gee, you look good for 63. I go, yeah, I know. Because if I told him I was 53, they say, crap, you look like for 63, right? For 53. So I lie about my age, making myself older so I could look better. But, you know, and he likes, no, I never thought of that. I go, yeah, yeah, don't drop your age. It makes you look bad. That's brotherly love right there. Right. I have a question to ask. What qualities have you taken from your father that are part of your fatherhood today? So, you know, another element nobody knows about my youth is my father lost his father when he was four and lost his mother when he was 12. So my father's parenting skills were not learned from a from a dad. They were learned from a grandfather, uh, a grandfather that, if I go back, was born pre pre nineteen hundred, right? So you can imagine. So the upbringing was was very. So my dad, you know, has apologized a few times. Says, "Look, I don't know if I was a good dad or not, but I, I didn't have a model to, to go by, right?" And that struck me, um, and, and it sort of said to my to me so what did my father do right and what did did he do wrong right so i like to tease him i don't do it anymore because now it really touches his emotional cores i i like to tease him and say you never brought me to the park like you never brought me on a swing and you know and, and right but what my dad did do is he brought me around to meetings so when i was 11 years old i would sit in meetings, construction meetings, movie theater meetings. And so what I learned is there are very few things in life that you can dedicate yourself to and that they will never disappoint you. And work is one of those things. So when, when, when times get really tough in my personal life, I go back to what is my secure place, which is work. Uh, um, you know, my, my wife said to me the other day, you really have to bring three luggages full of work stuff on every trip we go. And I said, yeah, because it, it's my safe place. That's, that's right. And, and my father forgot some of the traumas he went through as a child or as a father when he lost, you know, four children by working. Like that was the therapy. The therapy was not go see a shrink and, you know, empty your heart and discuss it. It was tire yourself out mentally by working so hard. And then one day you wake up and say, hey, holy cow, I'm a millionaire. Oh my God, look at this. I got tons of money. I got tons. And now I got, now I got freedom. Now I can do what I want. Right? And all of a sudden you realize, hey, thanks to that, how I responded to the trauma, I, I, I got at a better place. I got out of it in a better place. Uh, you know, that's that's the number one lesson. The other thing I learned from my dad is, 
you can't be everything to everybody. Mm. Right? So you have to make choices in life. And I say this to university students all the time. What are you willing? And, 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 and the words and the way I say it are very important because people answer the wrong way. I, I normally say to people, what are you willing to give up to be successful? So most people will say, well, I'm willing to work 80 hours a week. I'm willing to do this. I'm no, 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 no. I didn't ask you what you're willing to do. I said, what are you willing to give up? Meaning, what are you willing to fail at? And I made a lot of people realize that the cost of success sometimes means bad parenting, horrible spouse. You, you, you know, like, like you can't be the best father, brother, you know, uh, uh, uncle, uh, partner, et cetera, et cetera. You, you got to fail at something. Now you choose what you want to fail at. And because being a father is one of the hardest things, a lot of people just say, you know what, I'll, I'll give up on that. And, and we see it. Some of the most successful people in the world have the most dysfunctional relationship with, with their kids, right? So I, I think the nicest thing my ex-mother-in-law said to me, because let me tell you, she never said anything nice to me while I was married to her daughter. But after I got divorced, she actually said to me, as much as it upset me that my daughter lost a husband and, you know, because of the divorce and so forth, what I'm happy is that your two boys actually found a father. And the fact of the matter is too many times fathers take for granted, well, you know, their mom is at home taking care of them or their mom is handling the education or their mom's handling the, call it psychoanalysis of whatever children go through. Well, our job is just to go hunting and, and bring back food and money on the table. And, and we forget that times have changed. Um, you know, if there's a time where men were seen as the, the, the problem to all of society's conflicts, I think today, gender neutrality, everybody's a problem. You got to, you know, I mean, I always like to say, so, you know, I have four boys and my youngest is a daughter. And my wife likes to say, I, you know, I, I want to make sure my daughter can, you know, can have her, her say, you know, that she's not in a, I guess the expression is in a bully relationship with a man. And I said, and I always say to my wife, stop it. I want her to be able to stand up to everybody, not just the man. I want, her, I want her to stand up to peer pressure from her girlfriends. I want her to stand up to other women who are going to judge her for being different, right? And, and, and it's, it's a very important thing because I tell my boys and, and, and my daughter this all the time. I say, look, people, you will never, never be able to make everybody happy. So if you're a woman and you're married and you have five kids, Oh my God, I can't believe it. You're such an old school woman. If you are a career woman and have no kids, oh, I can't believe it. You're not even a woman. Like, oh, you got no motherly, hey, come on, man. Like something's got to give here, right? I mean, there's got to be diversity in the world. Every, everybody's entitled to their way of living, of their way and, and their choices. And, and, and so we shouldn't, as, as, as parents, what I try to do is try and teach the children the only person you're allowed to judge is yourself. Have you progressed today? Have you, are you a better person today than you were six months ago? Did you react the right way in this condition, in this situation? That is the only person you're allowed to judge. Everybody else, you don't know what they're going through, right? And so I always like to tell, you know, my wife, I said, you know, Freud used to say that Every child's, you know, trauma is analyzed through the relationship with his mother. And my wife, who's in psychiatry, PhD from McGill and so forth, likes to look at me crooked and say, yeah, that's right. Let's blame it on the women all the time. And I look at her and I say, no, but it's true. That was the case. In the next generation, what I'm hoping to hear therapists say is, what was the relationship with your mother? And what was the relationship with your father? Let's see which one of them two affected you maybe negatively and what did they do wrong so that maybe we can document it and realize, right? And, and so 
people need to understand that men are not, you know, and, and I have this debate with my mother all the time. Every time I have a, a, an argument with my parents and I take my father's side in the argument, my mother says, I can't believe it. I carried you for nine months and you're going to agree with your dad. So they say, <laughs> so what are you telling me? That all he did was he, he just donated like in a cup or something? Like, come on, man. Like, he's more than just like, yes, you carried me for nine months. Who cares? Like, let's move on. I'm 53 years old today, right? And I think it's very important that men realize the importance of a male father figure and that women understand that by men and fathers taking more of a presence, it does not diminish in any way their importance, their value, their, you know, need. Because at the end of the day, you know, because of the gender, I guess, stereotypes, you know, you're supposed to go cry and have empathy from your mother and you're supposed to get the hard knocks of life from your dad, right? But I've seen the opposite. I've seen women that are tougher than men, you know, and of the stereotype. And so today I can tell you that a well-rounded child needs to have the presence of both parents um, and any... Any parent trying to diminish the other parent's importance for me is just really, you know, selfish and, and hurting their children at the end. Um, it's interesting that, like I said, you know, my 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 kids, my two older boys found the father, as my ex mother in law would say, but I can't disagree with it, right? And it's basically not a court order, but it's a divorce situation that put me in a situation where I had the kids three days out of four, uh, out of seven. And so I had to be there. It wasn't about, hey, okay, the nanny's gonna take care of it. And so now all of a sudden, society forced me to show up and step up at bat and, and be a father. And have I always been a good father? I, I, I don't know. What I can tell you is I try and put dads and moms at the top of the pyramid. And then I put everybody else, you know, all the other family members, aunts, uncles, grandparents, the second level, and then friends at the third level and so forth and so forth. And as much as friends are important, I think ultimately your parents are the people who are going to back you or help you or take care of you. And, and if they don't, it's just, you know, there's like I've had I've had fathers tell me, you know, I don't want my kids to work with me. I want them to go work for somebody else, be be abused a bit, be, you know, be beaten up in the real world so that they can appreciate once I die what I leave them. But why? Like, why wouldn't you want, you know, so uh, I'll tell you a story that this because of COVID, it took three years to build a theater that was supposed to take six months. Mm -hmm. Uh and so my dad one day was talking to me and started crying. And he says, you know, you don't understand what you did when you sent your older boy, my 24-year-old, to work on the construction site as a, as a handyman, as a carpenter, as a, you know, a, 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 what we call in French, a journalier. He says, what do you mean? So, you know, I sat there and I said, after all the sacrifices I've done, after all the work you've put in, seriously, at 20, 22, 23 years old, he's got a start as a, as, a, as, a, as a laborer on a construction site? He said, you're not getting it, are you? He's got to realize that. So when he moves into the office, he says, you know what? I did that. I passed the broom. I know what it is. I don't want to go back to that. I'd rather have this job. I'd rather wear the suit and the tie. And, the, and, so, and so you've got to do that. But I think it's a little cruel when it's go do it somewhere else. Do it away from my eyes. Right. So that I don't have to think about the fact that it's not, you know, it's not the nicest thing to see your son go back to the humble beginnings we had. But, hey, I always like to say to my kids, progress isn't you getting spoon fed. Progress is you getting to where I am at 50, but getting there by 40. 
or getting there by 35. So now we've gained 10, 15 years. That's progress, is that we've saved 10 years of learning, 15 years of learning. So now you're going to be at 60. You should be more intelligent than me, more wiser than me, more experienced than me. And my grandkids better be better prepared and so forth and so forth and so forth at 30. Because that is what we should be doing and not saying to our kids, suffer. You know, go through the same path I went to. And it's only at 50 that you'll be able to get yourself a real expensive car. Why? Why couldn't you do it at 30? Yeah. That's what I, mean, I learned from my father in the relationship with him. Well, I mean, there's so many nuggets that I picked up on that you were sharing. One of the ones was talking kind of to the end, you were talking about progress, you know, and, and being able to accelerate. I'm going to use that word, accelerate their success, we'll say, or their where they get to at a certain point in time, as opposed to being at 50, it's 40. So, I mean, I think it's, but that also relates to your, your comment about, you know, are you getting better every single day? Uh, right. Are you better today than you were yesterday? Are, you know, are you, are, if you, have you taken these next steps? And so I think that's also very powerful. I mean, clearly the relationship is I think the core though, is what I also heard. Relationship with your dad, but also the relationship you now have with your your children and, and the focus that you have on that. And so those are really, I think, critical principles that, yeah. That's, and I that's think, look, and, and I think on. one of the, I think one of the most important elements, at least for what I would call working parents, well, let's call them working dads, working moms, doesn't matter, working parents. We feel so guilty when we can't show up mm. to a football game or, you know, like, for example, my son has a, one of my boys has a football game on Friday and I'm going to be in LA celebrating Robert Hershevac's birthday. Somebody's going to say like, buddy, do you have your priorities right? Right? That's, but, you know, Robert only turned 60 once. My son Delano has another nine football games after that one that, I, that I'm going to make. Right. So I've got to choose that priority. So there's no reason for me to feel guilty. But I also have to say that I didn't show up to, you know, my father never, I think my father showed up to one rugby game I played. Yeah. I still, I'm enamored or I'm in awe of the relationship between my dad and I. Right. So, but I've seen tons of dads show up at every game and 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 sh sure as a 16 year old it affected me as if to say like but am i really important right when you, you know what when, when kids go through that hormonal change where people hate me the whole world hate me you know my, my, my parents just you know grounded me so so i guess i'm a horrible you know a child or whatever, whatever so we all go through those dark days and i can yeah. tell you that Today, some of my colleagues from the rugby squad, their dads are nowhere to be seen. Some of those guys don't even want to talk to their dads. Some of them, you know, like have totally broken all link with them, but I don't get it. And, and then the other thing that, that I think we all need to, to learn is, so I have, um, my third boy is a fencer. Uh, a Canadian champion. He's, you know, went to the Commonwealth Games. So it was, I, I never fenced. And everybody says, yeah, but but it's okay that his, his sport is fencing because that way there's no competition. That way I'm not trying to relive my youth through he's going to make the squad, you know, he's going to make the football team so that I could dream that I would have made the CFL or the NFL. No, 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 no. Let kids live their life. Right. One of the biggest um, one of the biggest things that I get accused of often is having a big ego. Right. Usually from people who don't know me. And one of the things that I always like to say was when my wife was pregnant with my fourth child, my fourth boy. She had she said she had a dream. And in her mind, that child was had to have my name. He had to be Vince Guzzo Jr., the second or whatever, right? And when she brought it up to me, I said, there's not one chance in hell that any of my children 
will ever be a junior. She goes, what? Listen to me. It's bad enough. They're going to have to live with me as their father, that omnipresent person in Montreal, greater Montreal, then Canada, and so forth and so forth. I don't want somebody to say, hey, your name is Vince Guzzo, like the guy from Dragon's Den or from the... Yeah, yeah, I'm actually his son. You know, the, oh, my God, oh, you look like your dad or, you, you know, you've got the same negative traits as your dad or whatever. Like, I don't need that. Give him his own name. Give him his own identity. Now, you know, my older boy is named after my grandfather. My second boy is named after the king of Italy, Vittorio Emanuele. My third boy is named after my present father-in-law, Vito. My fourth boy, because we didn't have a name and I didn't want to give him Vince as a name, we actually called him Delano, which is, you know, FDR's middle name. And, and then my daughter's named Rosella, which is, a, which is a modification on my mother's Rosetta's name. And, and a lot of people call that a tradition. A lot of people want to, you know, we're in a time where tradition has to be destroyed. We, have to, we don't have to take the good of the tradition. So that tradition was associating the name to somebody that was important in your life. My, grand, my father, you know, my father-in-law, you know, the king of Italy. You know, there's a certain sense of, you know, when, when Vittorio, the one that's in, in Venice right now, when he goes to Italy and pulls out his passport, you know, the, the, the custom immigration guys always have a double look. Like, are you related to the old king of Italy? Like, you know, same thing with Delano. When you ask Delano, why are you call Delano? He says, oh, because it's the middle name of one of the presidents of the United States. Which, whether we like it or not, is an association to greatness, to grandeur, you know, to... And, and, and it's to aspire to something uh, a greater. And I think that's what we should instill in our children, to aspire to more than we have. Um, you know, I, I tell my kids all the time, you don't work to make money. You work to get freedom. And that freedom is attained by the money you make. But ultimately, it's the freedom to buy a car or not buy a car. To buy a very expensive car or a least expensive. You know, that's, the, that's what we need to instill into our kids. And as much as sometimes, maybe because of my origins, maybe because of the way I talk, maybe what, sometimes I get portrayed as a bit of a macho, a bit of a, guy's guy or whatever you know on dragon's den out of all of the deals i've done there's only one deal that i did with a guy every other deal is with a woman and in fact that's because i think women are probably better partners i think they understand better and there's no there's less conflict because we complement each other a bit like a marriage right we'll complement each other a guy, it's, you know, you got two guys arguing on which way to bring this company. And so people need to understand that when my daughter was born and everybody liked to tease me and say, oh, my God, four boys. And now you got that daughter. You know, that's that's God's way of putting you back into, you know, so guys, the person who's going to run the business is just born. He's the one who's going to be my he's going to be my memory. At family gathering, she's gonna sit there with her brothers and she's gonna look at all of them and she's gonna say, Hey, you guys finished being. If daddy was here right now, would you guys be talking and fighting amongst each other like that? No. So, and, and, and that's what, you know, every child has his bond, his connection to the other five. I can tell you that, for example, my kids will not use the terminology half brother or half sister. They will say, that's my brother. That's my sister. That's it. And when my boys were younger, somebody said to them, oh, he's your half brother. He's got two ears, two arms, two legs. Where's the half part? I mean, why, why is he half anything? No, no, but legally that's what he is. No, he's not. He's a good fellow and he's my brother. That's it. We're done. We're not having this argument. Right? Because family is family. And, and that's what I've instilled in my children. And so, you know, that importance is, is key 
in bringing up, you know, I think that with, with the disappearance of religion in our everyday life, I think people haven't understood that religion was a place to go when there was nobody in your family you could go to. It was like your, your therapist. You went to see your priest or you went to see your rabbi or, you know, now those people are, you know, dwindling away and, and, and we're shying away from them. So as parents, I think we have a, a, a bigger responsibility now. I think now we have to go back and we have to make sure that what we've learned, what we've experienced gets brought down to our kids. Good stuff. Good stuff. Got a question for you. Can Since you have five kids, can you talk? to us about your journey becoming a dad, the fears, hopes, and challenges that came up in the process, and how did you manage them when they came up? Because it probably, maybe, I'm not going to make an assumption, was it different for each child since you have five of them? So, I can tell you that all you can do is use the experience of the first one when raising the second one, use the experience of one and two when you're raising the third, and one, two, three, when the fourth, and then when my daughter came along, I said, okay, wait up a minute. Now I have a problem. It's a totally different, you know, reaction to stuff and, and so forth. So the truth of the matter is I have five kids. Not one of them is identical to the other in personality, in mannerism, in way of acting. And what's funny is that my oldest boy was always the one that people would say, he's exactly like you. He's a photocopy of you. Okay. Then my second one, everybody would say, ah, he's like your ex-wife. He's like, you know, okay. Then the third one, everybody would say, ah, him and your second one are identical. Really? <laughs> Think about it. Like, I want you to realize what you're saying. Because what do you mean? Well, you realize that the only connection between those two is me and not, not their mother's. So if they're identical, that means they're like me. And then the fourth one, oh, my God. When I hear him talk, you know, he's 13 years old. When I hear him talk, he's like you. It's like I'm hearing you. Okay? Oh, my God. And then your daughter, oh, my God. When she talks, she's a pit bull like you. She's like, you know, you know she takes no crap from anybody. <laughs> so I look at people all the time and I say, you do realize that every one of them is a reflection of their parents at a given time when we were raising them. Meaning, I was maybe a little rough, uh, rough on the edges when I had my first son. So sometimes he talks a bit like a trucker and he shouldn't, but anyway, it is what it is. And the second <laughs> one, maybe by that time I was a little more diplomatic. I was a little more thinking of a political career. So I started being a little more suave in my talking. So he's a little more of a, you know, a diplomat and he knows how to handle and then when the third one came along, you know, and so, so we teach kids in different ways, but they also have their own DNA, right? I, I, as I like to say, you know, kids are 50-50. Yeah, sort of. You don't know what DNA they've taken, you, you know? Uh, uh, you know, there's a song that always says, you know, you got the looks, I got the brains, let's make a lot of money. So my wife always tells me, ah, oh, our daughter looks 100% like me. That's amazing. I wanted to look like a woman. I don't want her to look like a man. I want her to think like me, though. I don't want her to be less sensitive. I want her to go for the jugglers. I want her to take no crap from other women. I want her to take none of the jealousy, the envy, the connivingness from other women. And I sure as have no worry about her standing up to a man because she stands up to four brothers. And she's been doing that from birth. And that's right. what a lot of people need to understand, right? And so the teaching sometimes is outside of our hands. In other words, it's hard for me to teach my daughter how to be with four brothers. I, I didn't have four brothers. But she's doing a great job. Trust me, she's doing a great job. She's holding her own. She can be vicious when she gets angry. She keeps no prisoners. She's perfect for the movie business. Put it that way. <laughs> she can thrive in LA. She's all set. You know, there's, right. I mean, there's a there's a couple of key things that I, I think I've heard. You know, one throughout your as you've been sharing, 
yeah, the importance of, of your family and that family, how and how that relates to creating identity. You said they're each individuals, but they still have this core identity that is part of that family. And, and, and that family, I think, is held together by that idea of relationship. Uh, you know, there's one thing you mentioned that I'm curious about. And if you want to talk about, I'd love to ask you about this. You said you're a little bit in awe of the relationship you now have with your dad. Um, what's happened? How did that get to a point where you're so, it sounded like appreciative of where it is now? You know, somebody once told me that when I was going to turn 50, my whole life was going to change. So on June 11, 2019, I had this huge party at my house, 500 guests. We ra- it was funny because I you had to pay a thousand five hundred bucks to come to my to my birthday party. I was charging people to come, so I, I raised eight hundred thousand dollars for various hospitals, and basically I used my party, uh, which was also a roast, uh, as a means to fundraise and so forth. And it was my way of saying, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen that day, but if I'm going to become a different person, I might as well go to a drink party because I don't want to be you know like negative about it, right? Yeah. And so what was funny is I went to bed that night and nothing changed. And then a few weeks later, nothing changed. And then January, remember January of 2020, I had the big decision of do I throw my name into the leadership race of the Conservative Party of Canada or I don't. And at that moment, you know, I got some feedback from partners and friends out of China and they were telling me it's it's a mess out here. What the hell are you talking about? And so I decided not to do that, that, that experience. But after two years of COVID, now is it the pandemic? Is it turning 50? And But everything's changed. All of a sudden, you realize, hey, wait up a minute. What's life expectancy for a man? 75? So what do I got? 25 years left? So I got to try now and get, in 25 years, more satisfaction, more happiness, more than I did the first 50 years. Because I coasted the first 25 thinking, I had tons of time. I was going to live forever. And then the other 25, I sacrificed working, this, that, that. I didn't even see the time pass by. I said, what do you mean I'm 50? What do you? And, and, I, and I say this as a joke often. I say to people, you know, they tell me, so how do you feel? Like, you know, you're 53, you look good. And I don't know how I look. I look in the mirror and there's this freaking guy who's like in his 50s, who's always in the way. And I said, can you get out of the way? I want to see myself in the mirror. <laughs> what the hell is this old guy in front of me? Get out of the way. I, re- I, I can relate. Like I'm, not, I'm not there, but I can relate. I'm feeling kind of similar. Right. So And, and so... And so that's where, you know, I said to myself, hey, that's where, that's when I realized, I said to myself, you know, I'm an only child. When my, when my dad passes, when my mom passes, split it as you want. I become an orphan. Mm -hmm. Call it what you want. Mm -hmm. I'm an orphan. I have no brothers Mm -hmm. or sisters to talk to. I have no connection to any siblings with who I can say, hey, do you remember when dad used to do that or say this or say that? The only guy who can remember the conversations him and I had are him and I, because there was no no sibling there, no nobody there. And so I said to myself, wow. And you gotta remember, it, when you when you go on a show like, you know, Dragon's Den, It's amazing. It's a great experience. But one of the problems you get is you see pictures of yourself five years ago. (laughs) And whether you like it or not, you see pictures of yourself for you, and then you go, holy. And so I went to a I went to a food show this year during one of the breaks that we had on uh, while we were filming. And everybody said, Hey, that's the guy from Dragon's Day. You know, so they saw the flower, they saw my name tag or whatever. But a whole bunch of people said to me, you look a lot younger. I said, really? You think so? Said, yeah, you look a lot younger. 
And and so all of a sudden you, you look at yourself, you, you know, it's sort of like you get to see yourself aging. It makes you reflect. You know, you get to see pictures of your dad. And this year, particularly, you know, there was a there's a pitch where as a gift, you interview your parents and, and they write a book, a family story book, which goes down to and what's funny about that is that I've been telling my wife since 2005, we should do a book every year on pictures, only pictures, and we just call it what we've seen or see what I've seen in that year, 2005, 2006, so that the kids one day will say, what do you mean? Like, you know, my daughter the other day said to me, I went to Paris. Yeah, you were like eight months old, but yeah, you went to Paris. Or you were three months old. Yeah, you, we went to Paris because it was St. Valentine's Day and I wanted to take your mom to Paris. So I took her, but you were too young. She didn't want to leave you behind and you're the only daughter. And she, and so, yeah, you were there and you cried like a crazy child every time and you drove me crazy, right? And so, oh my God, I want to go back to Paris. But she had never realized that. Like how many times, you know, do we sit down at dinner and we talk and, you know, my wife will say, yeah, so when I went to law school, the kids will say, you went to law school? Yeah, your mom went, she did two years of law school. Now she's in, you know, psychiatry, but before she was in, in law school. How come we don't know that you went to law school? Well, because maybe we didn't communicate that, right? But how many other stuff did we not communicate? How many beauties did we not communicate? Now, because of Instagram, we're all doing Instagram posts or whatever, but... That's fake almost sometimes, right? So, you know, I like the people who look at my posts and some guy tried to determine my mood swings based on my Instagram post. You're not getting it, are you? When I see the, I see the message that I like, it's, this is an important message. It's got nothing to do with how I'm feeling. It just gets posted because it gets posted. It, it may not mean anything about my life, but it's that appreciation that you see. And then as you see... You know, when you look at a dad, you look at the tough guy, you look at the rock. You know, one of my kids many, many years ago made a mistake and I severely disciplined him. And a year later, he said to me, you know what, dad, thanks for, thanks for being there for me and thanks for doing that because you put me back on the right track, you know. My friends were taking me in the wrong path and so forth. This summer, another one of my boys, you know, did something and I took care of, you know, limiting the damages, I like to say. And and it was funny because he thanked me. He says, thanks for being there for me. And I looked at him and I said, but I'm your father. I may not be happy all the time about what you do, but I'll always be there. And I'm also always going to be there to make sure that you're a respectful citizen, that you live up to your mistakes. I don't want them to damage you forever. And, you know, but but, but you need to. You need to fess up the mistakes you've done. And, and so that allowed me to realize how significant my father had been in my life, how when I did stupidities, as long as I didn't get caught, nobody knew. The minute I got caught, my go-to person was my dad. Because I knew I would get raw honesty. I would get help, un undevoted help, unconditional help. And so in the last two to three years, it, it, it was a little sad for me to see that the roles had changed with my dad. I had now become his rock. So now he's fearful to make certain decisions because he says, why? Well, I, I don't know. What if I'm being, you know, overly confident about this investment, let's say. So he comes to me, says, you know, what would you do? And every once in a while, you know, to try and get me personally, you know, motivated in the thing. He, sometimes he says to me, 
Because, you know, at the end of the day, whatever I do is going to be yours because who am I giving it to you? I only have one child left, right? Mm. Okay, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Whether it's mine or not, it doesn't matter. I, I'm there for you. I, I, you know, let's go over this together. Type of thing, right? And that's, you know, that's how that's changed. And then vice versa, I, you know, do the same thing with my children. And when I turned 50, some of my friends roasted me. Uh, and then a, a professional comedian roasted me. But one of my friends, uh, a guy called Sal Parasugo, which is our, you know, the, 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 the denim legend of Canada, um, Santana jeans and so forth. What he said was that the thing he admired the most was the loyalty my kids had towards me and how much my kids would defend me when I was not in the room and somebody tried to, whether in a sarcastic way or whether just to be funny or, you know, thinking, you know, just to tease them, would say something bad about me. He was impressed. He said, I, I can't believe on how, holy cow. Like, it was like, you know, the Fantastic Fives got together and they're like just coming after it, right? And so for me, it was like, I guess I'm doing something right, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. I would imagine any father would love to hear a similar message from somebody yeah, who's observing. I, I, yeah, I think ultimately it's the, you know, it's the accomplishment. Um, you know, being a parent is, is a, and this is going to sound weird. It's a very ungrateful job. Because at the end of the day, what you're doing is, if you're doing your job right, you're raising them to face the world by themselves because you know you won't be there forever. Right? And, and so I tell my wife often, and she hates me every time I say it. You know, she, she sometimes will argue with me and say that, I can't believe how rude your daughter is. I can't believe you tolerate how rude she is with me. And I said, look, Maria, your daughter needs to stand up to you first before she can stand up to any other person in the world. If you can stand up to your mother, you can stand up to anybody. <laughs> wow. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're, we've almost run out of time. And there's so much more. But I'll, I'll just say that uh, I just want to say, Vincenzo, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, if you haven't written a book, I'm ready for the book. We'll, we'll, we'll write a we'll write a book. The first fifty years, <laughs> what I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll go in line with what you want to capture, right? You talk about right. every year doing those things. It'll be a nice way to encapsulate all that knowledge, the wisdom, and insight that you've shared with us today. So, yeah. Great. On behalf of Drew, myself, uh, Dad Central, and fathers everywhere, we want to thank everything you have done, are doing, and will be doing, first of all, as a father, and second of all, business-wise. And uh, we look forward to hearing some more. Hopefully, we can have you back. And for everyone, you can watch himself and the other dragons on Dragons Den Live on CBC Television on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, going into their 17th season. It's a, it's a absolute, it's a CBC. Staple. Yes, absolutely. So we want to thank you so much for taking the time. Make sure you give yourself grace and don't just manage your time, manage your energy. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me guys. I appreciate right, it. Take care. Have a great day. All right. There we go. That was amazing. I mean, there's that many themes that oh. I could pick up on, but, uh, I really loved the loyalty piece at the end. I love the helping children uh, take ownership. Um, I think there's a big part of what he was sharing that really connects to, for me, identity, right? And I think that all ties in with the family, the relationships, and I think that's really strong. And I love it when he's you know, instilling in his children through his example, but also just in terms of the stories he's telling them, how he's communicating with them, that you know, it's about your development first and who you're becoming. And then showing up that way in the world, whether that's in your family. I love the story of his uh, his daughter uh, against the the four boys, but also daughter's mom. And so just those 
those elements to me, I think are very great takeaways for dads to, you know, the more that you can model that, live that out, and then instill that in your children, what it means for them as they grow. Cause that's, that's what we're about, right? Getting your kids yeah. tools to be successful in life. Uh, so many take homes, but one that we haven't had on the show as of yet, and something I encounter all the time, I'm fathering my father. Mm. Cause, and I can relate to Vincenzo, what he said in my earlier days, my relationship with my father was not great. And it took my dad almost dying of a heart attack to change our relationship. And now we're each other's best friends. So I, I want to put it out there for fathers. If your father's still alive, do your best to have that relationship because he's going to probably need you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, there's a lot of power and even if it's restoring that relationship, if it hasn't yeah. been where you need to be. Jared Lopes talked about that on his uh, when he shared about mm -hmm. his journey when he didn't have his father. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of power in that. That's a great example. Thank you for bringing that up, too. Yeah, that's that's because our fathers are living longer. And if you're a son, especially if you're only son, they're going to turn to you. They're yeah. going to turn to you. So you can get a double challenge. You may also be not only raising your kids, but helping your father. And that's something that a lot of fathers don't realize it, but when it hits them, it can be a big challenge, but great conversation. As always, we want to say that the Dad Central Show is sponsored by Dove Men Plus Care. Dove Men Plus Care believes care is the best of a man because when men care for themselves and others, there is positive impact. If you want to get in touch with us, and we'd love you to, email us at podcast.datcentral.ca. Email us. Make sure you follow us. Subscribe to us wherever you're listening or watching this. It's appreciated and not taken for granted. If you want to watch or listen to the podcast, dadcentral.ca forward slash podcast. And the website piles of free resources for dads, families, etc. on dadcentral.ca. So as always, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching. Please share it out. Please provide feedback. Make sure you give yourself grace and don't just manage your time, manage your energy. Take care.